So the title of my message tonight is Knowing God and His Feet. Knowing God and His Feet. And you know, feet are very important. Uh, if you hurt your feet or bruise your feet or break your feet or do anything to your feet, you soon discover how important they really are. And uh, it's amazing to understand that God is interested in the small things as well as the big things. And in our passage of Scripture, we find that Moses brought 70 of the elders of Israel up to the mountain, and they saw the feet of God. Now that's very important, because all of the cults don't believe that God has a human body. The Jehovah's Witnesses, even Islam, they teach that God is, is a spirit and has no physical body. So for them, this is a real problem. Because it clearly says they saw the God of Israel and his feet. And then interestingly, it talks about Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus and heard the word. And you know, it's important to understand that, you know, whose feet you sit at has a great deal to hear of what you listen to. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned nothing about the gospel. And you can sit at the feet of the world, you can sit at the feet of philosophy or politics or, or science, but if, you, if you're at the wrong feet, it's no great feet. So tonight we're going to look at what it means to sit and to know God and his feet. Now, if you have some time to spend, I would recommend to you to look up a thing on YouTube by a guy called S.M. Lockridge, and uh, it's called That's My King. And it says, do you know him? And I'm going to read a little bit of what it says. And if you, if you go onto YouTube, you'll find this, where he's preaching us, and it's really amazing to, to hear what he says. And he starts off and he says, I wonder if you know him. Do you know my king? The Bible says he's the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. Now, that's my king. No barriers can hinder him from pouring out his blessings. No means of measure can divine his, define his limitless love. No far-seeing telescope can bring into visibility the coastline of his shoreless supply. He is enduringly strong. He is eternally steadfast. He is, or, or, he is in, in mortality graceful. He is imperially powerful. He is impartially merciful. That's my king. He is God's son. He is the sinner's savior. He is the centerpiece of civilization. He is unparalleled. He is unprecedented. He is preeminent. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's a fundamental, he's a fundamental doctrine in true theology. He's a miracle of the age. He's a superlative of everything good. He's the only one able to supply all our needs simultaneously. And he goes on and on and on how he is my king. And a lot of people do not know who God really is because they don't want to sit at his feet. You know, I don't know if you've ever sat at anyone's feet before, but in order to sit at someone's feet, normally you have to get down beside them. Amen. Amen. And in order to get with the Lord, a lot of times you have to get down and humble yourself and look at things from a different perspective. You remember in Matthew chapter 17, the Lord took two, uh, three of his disciples up into the Mount of Transfiguration, and he was trans transfigured before them, and he had this white raiment. And then out of the clouds came the voice of God, says, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Same thing happened here in Exodus. Uh, Moses took 70 of the elders up there, and they saw God, and the Bible says they ate with him. Now that reminds me over in uh, Genesis chapter 18, how the two angels and the Lord appeared to Abraham and sat in the tent and ate with him. Now for the cults, that's a real problem. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses, for instance, the so-called Jehovah's Witnesses will tell you that God is a spirit and no man has seen God at any time. 
But they have a problem with this because here God sat in the tent and ate with them. And here in Exodus, God took 70 elders and Moses up to the, to, to, to the, the, the heights there and ate with them again. You'd almost think that God wants to eat with his people. <laughs> Fellowship. Be with his people. I'm reminded in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that God walked in the, in the, the, the calm of the day to be with Adam. God wants to fellowship with his people. Amen. Mary and Martha. Tremendous lessons we can learn. Martha was comforted about with many, many things. And she came to the Lord and complained. Do you not care? My, my sister Mary is sad. She, she has the audacity to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. Talk about priorities. I'll read my Bible when I get everything done. I'll pray when I get everything done. And I've heard this oftentimes. When everything in my life is going perfectly, then I'll go to church. Martha was the kind of person who wanted everything done. And now there's nothing wrong with what Martha wanted. It needed to be done. But Jesus said Mary had chosen the good part. And I often think when we get to heaven and God's going to set us down and he's going to show us all the things we spent our life on. And he's going to say, you only had one job. <laughs> and we're going to say, but, but Lord, I was busy. Lord, I, I, I had to pay the bills. Lord, I had to do this. Lord... And the Lord's going to say, but you had one job. Set at the feet of Jesus. Remember the woman who broke the alabaster box came and washed the feet of Jesus with her tears. Remember Jesus washed the feet of the disciples, but none of the disciples washed the feet of Jesus. They were too big for that. And here's some interesting verses about feet. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Revelation 2.18. And unto the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like fine brass. In our passage in, in Exodus, we find that God walks on streets of sapphire. Now, sapphire is as hard as diamond, but it was clear as glass. What does it mean for us to know God and about his feet? Well, knowing God is the God who brings salvation and liberty into our lives. We're not saved because of what we could do. We're not saved because we want to join a religion. We're saved of what God has done in our life. Amen. Salvation, as Jonah said, is of the Lord. The Lord said in Mark, Matthew chapter 7, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many shall, will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There's two ways you can know someone. Now, you can say, well, I know of them. Or I can know them personally. And that's the kind of knowledge we're talking about here. About having a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Being saved. Oh, many people know about God. They certainly curse his name. But they don't know God. And more importantly, it's not that they don't know God, it's that God doesn't know them in that personal relationship. What did Paul say? I like Paul. I really do. Here's what Paul said in Philippians. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless and count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and who count them but dung, that I may win Christ. I be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness of, of, which is of God by faith, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, that I might know him. The chief aim of the Christian is to know God. That's it. It's really simple, amen. To get... To know God. Now, how do you get to know God? Amen. 
through his word. By reading it, believing it, and obeying it. I knew a guy many, many years ago who had a favorite Bible verse. And his favorite Bible verse was 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. But grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And whenever a testimony came along or anyone wanted to quote a Bible verse, that was his favorite Bible verse. But this guy, his name is Ray, who is no longer with us, he's gone, refused to get baptized. Refused. He came from a Catholic background and didn't want to disappoint his family. So every time we had a baptism or service, he was, nope, I'm not getting baptized. But I'm growing in grace. How can you grow in grace when you refuse to obey the clear commands of the Bible? Sure. Amen. How can you say you know God and do the exact opposite to what he says? Yeah. Amen. To me, that's not knowing. As the poem said that uh, S.M. Lockridge said, he is enduringly strong, he is entirely sincere, and he is eternally steadfast. So why are we not the same? Amen. Knowing God not only brings you salvation and, and, and liberty, but also it will bring you, let me see, we've got here, security in life. Amen. There's a famous verse that I have been misquoting for years. In earnestly. I thought I was doing it right, but Ross pulled me up one day and said, you're quoting that verse wrong. And he's right, I was. And the verse I always say is, and, 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 and if the Son therefore shall make you free, you sh if, 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 I used to say, if the Son therefore shall set you free, you shall be free indeed. But that's not what the verse says. Now, I don't know how I got that mixed up in my mind. But the verse says in John 8, 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. It's not that he set us free, he made us free. Yeah. It's not that he opened the door and we ran. <laughs> he made it. Yeah. He's the one that did it. Yeah. Knowing God will bring you security in what you believe. Amen. Yeah. I like security. You know, when the, the, the people walking around and the bad guys are about and all the rest of it, I like the fact that I, well, I don't want to go into that, but I like the fact that I've got some security in the house. But for the believer, knowing God brings the security of the relationship. I, 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 I don't understand. You know, maybe you can pray for me. I don't understand these people who believe you can lose your salvation. Okay. If I thought I could lose my, I, what have I done today? Have I, have, oh, have, I done, oh, have I gone too far? How, how could you have... The, 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 let, me, let me put it in modern vernacular, right? Modern <laughs> vernacular. Say you were dating a person. And every day that person said to you, if you don't do what I want, I'm dumping you. If you didn't bring me the right flowers or the right chocolates or this, that, and the other, and you didn't do blah, 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 and all that, I'm going to dump you. How could you have a relationship with a person like that who every second said, I'm going to dump you? I'm going to. Is, is that how it goes? I don't know. How could you have a relationship with a person like that? How could you have a relationship with a God that you're afraid he's going to send you to hell after you believed? How, how, how could you be secure? Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Amen. Now, I'm not going to tell Jesus you're wrong. <laughs> Jesus, you, you know, you're a wee bit wrong there. That's not what you really mean. We're secure. Mm -hmm. Secure the things we believe. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Not set you free. Make you free. Amen. Jesus made us free and made us secure Amen. because we have a personal relationship with him. And that relationship doesn't change even if we sin. Because 1 John tells us, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we can go to him. You see, and th this is my problem with people who believe that you can lose your salvation. You're messing around with God's word. You better be careful there. I mean, you, you, you're saying that God's wrong. 
<laughs> and and I, I would be very careful. I know there are verses that seem to say that, but you have to interpret them in the clear verses that tell you the truth. But having a relationship with God helps us to be secure in what we believe. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. Notice belief comes first. That you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Not only does that relationship affect security in what we believe, but it affects security in how we behave. Behave, children. <laughs> behave yourself. Now, if you don't behave, having a relationship with God, a personal relationship, affects your behavior. It doesn't mean that you go back into the world and you be like, you look like the world, everything, nobody would know. You know what, what would be a most frightening thing is, and someone come up to you and say, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. You were a Christian? You? No. No. Come on. The reason why people know I'm a Christian is because my belief, my relationship with the Lord affects how I behave. I quit kicking dogs. <laughs> Knowing God's word, God's word makes a huge difference in our lives. That's why the devil wants to keep you away from it. Because this word will change your behavior. I got saved as a punk rocker. I was wild, man. I was really wild. I mean, I was, I, even the police were afraid of me. I'm serious. I mean, I, I would sit in walls and police cars and go by and I big bricks and, psh, and then they chased me. Great laugh. I was wild. But once I got saved and started reading this book, my behavior started to change. I often think of Martha and Mary, and Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And I'm sure Mary knew there were things that needed to be done. I'm sure she did. I'm sure Mary caught out the corner of her eye the looks from Martha. <laughs> but Mary sat there. And when questioned, even the Lord Jesus said, Martha, Martha, Martha. She has chosen a good thing. And that was at the feet of Jesus. Knowing God and having a personal relationship with him and sitting at his feet will also bring you not only security in how you behave, but security that brings you a balance into your life. You know, some people, they're all over here or they're all over here. Even in the Christian faith, there are groups that are way over here this and way over here that. But I find in the Bible, it's a balance of things. And it's, trust me, it's so unusual to find balanced preachers. I mean, a lot of them are way over here or way over here. And if you're not part of their group, then you're going to hell. And they'll kick you in there if they get half the chance. Or they're way over here, and, and if you, you don't believe everything they say, they'll kick you into hell, and, and they'll be the one who does it. But I think there's a balance in Christianity in the Bible. I think there's a balance that Christians need. Yeah. For instance, my wife and I were talking about this tonight, and uh, in marriage... Marriage is not about one person getting everything they want. It doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. Marriage, and I've said this for years, is two people pulling together equally in the same direction. Not one going that way and one going that way. Or one giving a lot of pulling and one like, ah, oh, I can't be bothered. It's two together. That's why the Bible says when two are married, they become one. Amen. And that's a balance. And yet there are so many people today who don't have that balance. Right. It's all, I remember a guy, a Russian, a Russian guy, <coughs> came to the church and he came for a while. And he told me he was going to whip his wife into shape. Because I'm the man. She should obey me. If not, I will whip her into shape. And I said, you can't do that. You've got to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says that husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. That doesn't include taking a weapon, whipping her into shape. Well, I'm the man! And I, I've known 
this is a wee hobby horse, I'm going to jump on this for a second, so excuse me. There are, there are many men, I'm sure there are women too, that have this idea that, it's, that marriage is all about them. I don't find that in the Bible. No. I find a balance between husbands and wives being a type of the Lord yeah. in his church in that relationship. Working together. Amen. Amen. And there's so many people today that because they don't spend the time reading the book, sitting at the feet of Jesus and learning the book, they're unbalanced. Yeah. You ever been unbalanced? You ever had a sore leg and you've had to kind of walk a kind of different way? And then eventually you get to the place where it heals, maybe, and you say, oh, oh. Oh, okay, that's better. I've, I've been having a problem I've mentioned before recently, and it, it's called a frozen shoulder. And it's one of these things older people get. And I asked my doctor about it, and he's like, <laughs> tough for you, pal. You'll just, it just, it'll resolve itself. Guess what? Hey. It's resolved itself. Praise I did some exercises and some stretches, and, and it, went, it went back to normal. But at the time... It, I, I couldn't do more than that. But now I'm getting pretty much there. Remember one time, I used to sleep, and, and my wife will testify to this, many years ago, I used I love sleeping with the window open. Even in winter. Loved it. And one day I did, I did that, and I got frozen all down my back. And I was walking around like that for days. <laughs> After that, I close the window. But you don't realize how unba unbalanced you are until you get straightened up. That's right. Amen. There's a lot of people out there having strange ideas and doctrines who don't realize how unbalanced they are until they sit at the feet of Jesus Amen. and the Lord straightens them out. That's what happened to Mary and Martha. The Lord straightened Martha out about what Mary was doing. And there's a lot of people, instead of being the big so-and-so and the big shot and all the rest of it, need to get at the feet of Jesus and just sit there and learn. Knowing God will not only help you in your salvation, and not only help you in your service, but your security, but it will also help you in your service. You cannot serve God until you've spent time at his feet. Amen. Those elders who were brought up, to Israel, brought up with Moses into the mount... They were there to get the commandments, again, because of what they did before. And they were going to go down and help Moses rule. But they could only help Moses rule and be used of God after they'd ate and sat at the feet of God. And there are so many people whose idea is, well, as soon as you get saved, rush into service. That might work for some people. But I think for most of us, we need to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn some things. What will we learn about God's will for our life and service and the lessons it will teach us? First of all, it will give us hope. If I don't have the Lord, I wouldn't have any hope. And not in this world. This world's done. I mean, you look at what's going on in the world today. I was, I was watching this thing about uh, Sound of Freedom, about the, the, the child... Um, Marketing is going on in the world today and all the things are going on and, and you've got all this garbage going on with COVID and all the rest of it. Yeah. This world's done. Oh, right, right, right. I mean, I used to think that maybe we could do stop, for, not anymore. All we can do is be a light in the darkness Amen. and win souls as, as, as the best we can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My hope is not in this world. Amen. Not only do, does it teach us hope, it teaches us humility. You have to get down to get to the feet of Jesus. My granddaughter is a wonderful person. I just love being with her. I really do. And by the way, she's fascinated with my feet. I, I have big feet. My wife has strange feet, but I have big feet. She really does. She has the weirdest feet I've ever seen in my life. But she loves me to get down beside her and put my feet right next to her. And she just looks at it. Serving God will teach you humility. Get down at his feet. Not only will it give you hope and give you humility, it'll give you holiness. 
Amen. You see, Martha was running around doing all kinds of stuff. But Mary was sat there. Moses went up to the mount and his face shone. Amen. Holiness. If you want God to change your life, you've got to be holy. The Bible says, holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. You know one of the key ingredients that's, that's missing in many Christians today is holiness. Holiness. Yeah. Not holier than thou, <laughs> but holiness. And part of that holiness is a humility. Yeah. And another thing you learn sitting at the feet of Jesus, and this is a very important lesson, it's always best to leave it to him. Abraham learned the hard way. <laughs> David, I was reading about him today in Bathsheba, uh, learned the hard way. Can you, can, you, can, you, can, can you imagine that palace that day? Nathan the prophet comes in. This guy stole this lamb and it was his only lamb. And, and, and what are we going to do? And David said, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill him. And the prophet Nathan, that big bony finger, said, Thou art the man. David was caught. You know why David got into that situation? Because, and this is very important. The reason why David got into that situation is that he had won a big battle and figured that's me done. I don't have to, I don't have to get in battles anymore. I can take it easy and let other people fight the battles. Now I'm going to say something that some people are not going to like. Not here perhaps, but some people are going to like. And I think the reason why many Christians get involved in sin is they get to the point in their life and say, well, I've gone to church enough. I've gone so well enough. I've done enough. It's time for me to just take it easy. Yeah. And that's when they get involved in sin. Right. And because they should be at the battlefront. Right. Not on the palace wandering around having a peek at what's going on over here, what's going on over there. Yeah. Right. You know, there are so many Christians that are so concerned about what everybody else is doing. Right. Instead of saying, Lord, where's my place in the battlefield? Yeah, Knowing God will help you in your service and your lessons. It'll help you have a hope. It'll help you to be humble. It'll help you to be holy. And it'll help you to leave everything to him. Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel and learned not very much about the gospel. Martha went around with it like a chicken without a head and didn't learn much about the gospel. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. I read again what it says in Luke chapter 10. It says, And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. And in verse 41, Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Can you imagine how lovely and wonderful and blessing it would be to sit at the feet of Jesus? Okay. Just, just, wow. just be with him. You, you couldn't buy that with all the tea in China. But yet when Jesus was here, so many people were busy doing other things instead of the, the, the good thing. I think the reason why they did that is they didn't know God the way they should have known God. Amen. If you know God, it's going to change you. Yeah. It's going to change what you believe. It's going to change your behavior. It's going to change what you do because you're going to spend much time with him. Gamaliel... Or the Lord? Whose feet are we going to sit at? I think we should sit at the feet of Jesus. So when someone tells you that, that, that God is a spirit and, and the, the God is, 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 Jesus is not God, point them to this passage of Scripture where the elders, 70 of them, Moses, sat at the feet of Jesus and ate with him. And he says, the God of Israel. God has feet. Let's sit at his feet. Amen. And let's be his feet, take the gospel to this world. Uh, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you for this award. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to study these things. Help us, Lord, to sit at your feet, that we might be changed people, we might be a people who has learned the things we need to learn and go out there and share the gospel with souls. Bless our time as we continue, Father. We commit it unto you in Jesus' precious name. Amen.